We're in the middle of a housing crisis affecting families across Northern California. It's expensive, supply is low, and building is not happening fast enough. Many families are on the verge or worried about losing the roof over their head and joining the thousands of people without a home. Hello, thank you for tuning in to this ABC 10 Plus look at the issues and possible solutions to this crisis. I'm ABC 10 investigative reporter Andy Judson. Now, if you remember, interest rates were low at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Real estate was red hot and homes were selling fast. But now the market has cooled in many ways. Earlier this year, I looked into what exactly happened in the Sacramento region and what we can expect to come. These homes that we're in now, yes, I sold one. The uh, pandemic was a wild ride for Sacramento's housing market. When they went up originally in 2018, just before the pandemic, they were running anywhere from the high threes to the low fours. Okay. This one sold for $7.45. Because we were all able to work from home, the pandemic brought the ability to live anywhere, as well as the demand for more space. And with that came competition. It felt like a piranha feeding frenzy. A frenzy that appraiser and housing analyst Ryan Lundquist describes as the most aggressive housing market he's ever seen. Yeah, it's, I think it's something that was unexpected and where the market went way above where it naturally would have. Normally, he says, the market rises for about eight years and then goes back down. We were to that point and then a global pandemic happens. Lots of people are thinking the market's gonna go down or there were all these predictions and then it did something that I think nobody expected. It exploded. Where we saw, you know, exponential growth, you know, prices up almost $200,000 within um, two years. That's that's really steep. With wildly low interest rates, houses in the Sacramento and surrounding region were selling like hotcakes. As soon as mortgage rates went below 3%, it was like a steroid was injected into the market. In fact, while the market steadily grew for nine years before the pandemic, it was nothing compared to the growth between March 2020 and May 2022. During those two short years, the median price of a home increased in our region by 42%, Lundquist says. It was really about targeting higher priced homes. Many use their equity, selling to buy bigger and newer elsewhere, like from the Bay to Sacramento. And also, I think people focusing more on Placer County and El Dorado County, where homes are larger. In fact, statistics show throughout our region, Placer County had the most newly constructed homes for six months straight. But things are changing again. We've basically seen the largest increase, the sharpest increase in mortgage rates in the past 40 years, you know, over the past few months. In 2020 and 2021, 30 year fixed interest rates were here below 3%. But in 2022, they spiked all the way up to over 7%. Honestly, I didn't think it was going to almost daily change like that. That was that was a okay. So how how do I keep my clients calm? Today they sit around 6%, which means interest rates are still double from where they stood during the pandemic. It's completely changed the market. And so, you know, earlier in the year, we were reporting really aggressive housing stats, massive demand, and then mortgage rates said, hold my beer, and we're in this market where um, I think, you know, the honeymoon is over. Over thanks to the Fed and the increase in interest rates to try and control the nation's inflation. I've just been telling people it's time to believe that the Fed is very serious when they want to see spending decrease to get inflation under control. And when you, you know, tar and it's like they're targeting housing as the sacrificial lamb on the altar. Some experts say the Fed's plan may be working, with the U.S. Bureau of Labor reporting the consumer price index, a measure of changes in prices over time, rose less in December than November. But with continued high housing interest rates, buyers simply just cannot afford what they could during the pandemic. I started in March with one client where her buying power was 460000 and now her buying power is three seventy five. Brian Ensminger felt this firsthand. We were pretty close to should we continue to rent. Um, we were seeing interest rates kind of come up and up, 
um, the availability was going down. They were on the hunt for a home to start their family. I would say, uh, you know, we, we toured uh, north of 20 and probably bit of, put a bit in on um, uh, close to 10. His agent, Alyssa Mazoy, guided him through the process. One thing that I advise my client is that let's focus on a, a monthly payment. What can you afford? and the area that you want to be in. And after a five month search, they prevailed, making Brian a first time homeowner just outside Natomas. To be able to go in and get something at the range we wanted, um, with the ability to do what we want, really a perfect fit. For that to happen, I think it shows that it's becoming a buyer's market. High interest rates and a fall in the average price of a home has changed the tune for those selling. It's hard for sellers to respond. And I, I think that sellers were in the driving driver's seat. They had nothing but glowing headlines for years. They're used to buyers who are offering over asking price, waiving all the contingencies, and really saying that, you know, I'm, uh, you know, where sellers would be in control. But today buyers like Brian appear to be in the driver's seat. We were able to buy a home at the time in the place that fed our criteria. I think that's the best we could ask for. I think buyers are in a place where they're, you know, eyeing prices and it's just more difficult to afford. So they have, um, you know, time on their side, you know, hands down. Realtors across our region are seeing this firsthand. Now it's going to take a little longer. Now on average, we're seeing 60 days. An astonishing comparison to how fast homes sold during the pandemic. Pandemic was a week. Specifically, Lundquist data shows half of all sales in 2021 took seven days or even less to sell. But that doesn't mean our market is easy for those looking to buy a home. Some people look at 7% today and say, stop your whining because I bought my first house in 1982 at 16%, right? The problem is in 1982, that house was $53,000. And so it's a totally different ball game today. That's why he says there's a 40% decline of those looking to buy a house within Sacramento's housing market. But come springtime, the housing market always heats up. I think that's a, a spring thing too. Well, wow, we're having another child. <laughs> and as mortgage rates and housing prices trickle downwards, many are hopeful more buyers will come to the market. But you never know. My crystal ball broke so long ago. It has duct tape all over it. And, you know, I, I just let's remember that I don't think anyone really predicted the pandemic market that happened. No matter the market, there is always people needing to move. People getting divorced, people getting married, people needing a bigger house. And realtors remain in the middle, helping both buyers and sellers, all while riding out our wild housing market. Let's not look back to say, the during COVID is that's the normal market. That's not. The life happens, you wanna move, let's make it happen. Take one buyer or that one seller and get excited with them about what you're changing their life. Let's move from the topics of buying homes to the idea of where exactly people are choosing to live. It's no secret that the job market post COVID-19 is filled with remote work or the option to work fully from home. Well, that's greatly impacting where exactly people are calling home. Here's how Sacramento and the Bay Area are becoming one mega region. Sacramento is changing. I have found Sacramento to be a really different place than when I was here last. Just a hellhole. You just think that it's kind of developing as a city. People are moving here. It was a good opportunity to come out here, kind of get out of the Bay Area. As well as moving away. I think it is time for me to kind of try to move somewhere else. But a massive amount of migration is happening in Northern California. But I was in the Bay Area the last 10 years. Well, I originally came from like the North Bay. Especially from the Bay to Sacramento. So we had a decade of change in two years, essentially, really. Um, and an easy thing to point to is flexible work schedules. The ability to work from home also brought the freedom to change where home is. In 2018 and 2019, pre-COVID, about 150,000 people left the Bay Area. When the pandemic hit, that number doubled, with nearly 305,000 leaving. It's just one of the shocking discoveries researchers found in a study conducted between UC Davis and two other universities that looked specifically at migration from the Bay Area to the Central Valley during the pandemic. That includes communities throughout the Sacramento region, 
San Joaquin Valley, and the Sierra foothills. Their interest came after finding that our region is melding together more than anywhere else in California. Growing into one large mega region. What they found is where people move depends on having easy access to where you need to go. Over time, whether it be a lifetime or multiple generations, people relocate further and further down highways. For example, in, in, on, along Highway 80, people may again be living in San Francisco, but then move to Vacaville or West Sacramento or continuing down Highway 80. People would increasingly move inland. With the ability to work from home, their research found rather than relocating gradually along highways, many made a leap, moving to their end goal location. Whereas someone might have moved from San Francisco to Sacramento to Roseville to El Dorado Hills, people were moving straight to Truckee. That final destination always depends on their income. Higher income households, much higher likelihood of moving to a place like Roseville or Folsom in the Sacramento area, lower income households, uh, much higher propensity to move to Stockton or Los Banos or Patterson. It's why so many are flocking from the Bay Area inland. It's more affordable. The average housing price in 20 years going from 600,000 to 1.5 million, that is a completely unsustainable rate of housing increase. The people who are coming from the Bay Area um, are in a sense being displaced themselves. And the cities people are leaving, others are not moving to. They're all losing. Meanwhile, Redfin found in January of 2022, the Sacramento metropolitan region was the fourth most popular destination in the nation for people looking to relocate to. This area, we actually have the space to build out. This is obvious when you drive along Highway 50 where you can see home after home being constructed. Now you remember that mega region? Well, it could be happening right here as experts say that Folsom and El Dorado Hills could be merging into one. The more multifamily, perhaps more townhomes, more, more condos of various sizes. And we've already seen developers try to answer the high demand with townhome and condo neighborhoods like the mill here in Sacramento and these new homes here in South Natomas and right here in Folsom. In fact, investment buyers and developers bought 56.3% more homes in Sacramento in 2021 than 2020, a Redfin study showed. But a state audit report released in 2022 and based on numbers from 2019 said there's still not enough housing for the demand. In the Sacramento region, we're short over 153,000 homes, driving up the cost of housing in our area. We're seeing more people who are being forced out, whether it's out of state or out of where they were living. But another reason folks are moving away is because of politics. And so when you see a demographic shift, we anticipate that we are gonna see a shift in change of votership. So more purple rather than red and blue. It's one of the reasons Bridget and her husband left Pollock Pines. We're avid shooters, we like our firearms, but the laws are getting stricter and stricter and stricter. She said the rising homeless problem, high taxes and price of living sealed the deal on their decision. They landed outside Charleston in Orangeburg County, South Carolina. You have so many more freedoms as an American. She's not alone. An exit of residents over the last decade resulted in California losing a congressional seat in 2021, the first time this has occurred in the state's history. The U.S. Census Bureau found while more people left California than came here, other places like Texas, Florida, and Colorado gained a congressional seat with more people moving there. I've been contemplating for the last three years. It's what local business owner Miguel Frias is considering. I'm a Sacramento native, born and raised. But since the start of the pandemic, he's been thinking of making a move. The last straw for me was just the way the whole pandemic was handled. And unfortunately, a lot of small business suffered to heavy restrictions and mandates. Others moving away didn't necessarily have a say in the matter. It's easy to point to climate refugees in California who are being displaced by fire. A growing concern is housing prices in desolate but fire prone areas are becoming more appealing as people look for places to move for lower cost. And due to climate change patterns that are really exacerbating our wildfire seasons, making them more intense, making them more frequent, um, that's really contributing to having people who have no place to go. You may have heard of this term before, 
squatters. It's basically a person who settles in or occupies a house or piece of property with no legal claim to it. Well, in California, some homeowners are dealing with a growing problem of squatters as rental protections added during the pandemic are making it more difficult for property owners to evict them. And some of these squatters have learned how to play the game. Here's a firsthand account from two Northern California homeowners in our investigation, Serial Squatters. This home is being held hostage. All right, 4915. Squatters, it's a name for occupants who don't pay rent. And that's who's lived here for the last nine months. And they know what they're doing. It's professional deadbeat tenants. They've learned to play the game. Hello? Well, it was our first house, you know. We got married there. We had our wedding reception there. Then as our family grew, we needed a, a larger place. Rather than sell, Karen and Skip Morarity have been renting their Fair Oaks home to several tenants for the last 34 years. We made it into an investment, but we planned to downsize and go back there. But before moving back, they decided to lease it one final time. It's a uh, Craigslist, it's cheap, free. <laughs> when a couple named Ann and Mario Figueroa reached out, they met for a house tour. Had a nice long conversation, it's, you know, wonderful people. To seal the deal, Karen requested documents, including a credit report and 401k statement. He has 20 times as much as I have in my 401k. With that, Karen and Skip handed over the keys in August 2022. Immediately, there were problems. In September, they were late. We deeply apologize. Mario's grandfather passed last week, and we had to contribute. When the next month came, then his mother. As December rolled around, Mario's father uh, was sick. That's when they stopped paying altogether. Without rent, Skip and Karen had to cover the mortgage. I'm holding off buying Christmas presents. Ten days before Christmas, Karen drove by. It looked like they were having a party. She could not handle it. She was melting down. Desperate for help, they reached out to their real estate agent. I've had hours of conversations with Karen frustrated, upset, crying. Gary Meek is familiar with squatters, but some, he says, are experts. Unfortunately, there are criminals out there that use amazing talent and education for bad. He asked to see the documents Mario and Anne provided when moving in and made a discovery. They've all been falsified. The bank statements, the credit reports, everything has been falsified. But they discovered something even more astonishing. This is not the first house the Figueroas have squatted in. They've squatted in this one and this one. In fact, court records show since 2008, there have been at least eight prior residences in Sacramento County alone that Mario and Ann have lived in for months and not paid rent. They've been evicted from homes in Wilton, Elk Grove, and Fair Oaks. Some just blocks from one another. One of those homes was Tari Guns. He was just so charmful and helpful and everything. And I thought, well, these are going to be good people. Right off the bat, rent was replaced with excuses. The same excuses Karen and Skip got. And it was so hard because they got to live there rent free. It took time and money to evict them. Having to go back and forth, court, filing, just everything. I just incurred so many financial issues that it was really hard. When she did finally get them out, what she found was shocking. We went in the house then, and there was a note taped to the sliding glass window that said, um, see you in bankruptcy court. Her anger doubled when she learned Karen and Skip were among their next victims. Their home is just two and a half miles from Tari's. How dare they? How dare they come and stay in the same area and keep doing it? So we wanted to get answers from the Figueroas. We wanted to hear and include their side in our reporting and ask why they keep doing this. Your call has been forwarded to an We called and left voicemails for both Mario and Anne. Hi, this message is for Anne. Then we went to speak with them at Karen and Skip's house. 
No one answered, but it seemed like they were there or had been recently. The light's on, but... After multiple attempts, we left a letter. Telling them we're requesting an interview with them. On our way out, we noticed the trash can. It's like there's fresh stuff in the trash can. At this point, the eviction process had started four months before. It looks like a lot of like refrigerated stuff, so maybe they moved out. Any steps taken towards getting them out, Karen and Skip credit to the man they hired to evict them. Once I get involved, they can start packing because they're going to go away. But as we've seen, California law makes it a lengthy and often costly process to evict squatters. If you follow administrative law, it will go step one, step two, step three, step four, and pretty much go by the book with a few exceptions. And this is one of those exceptions is when you get professional tenants the system was not built for people like them. This system is especially vulnerable due to COVID. For over two years, California created laws to protect tenants from being evicted while navigating the pandemic. Between that and backed up courts, California's system enables squatters, Barry says. We're so much into victims' rights, but the problem is in this case, they don't see the landlords as a victim. He says current law treats landlords like they're massive entities with endless funds. It's an issue because it's not true. About seven out of 10 um, properties that are being rented are rented by mom and pop investors. Instead, homeowners like Karen and Skip have to fight serial squatters. So this is just theft. And that's why there needs to be change, he says. I think that our owner's rights have been taken. For now, he recommends homeowners do their homework on potential tenants. You've got to do a background check. You've got to do a, a criminal eviction um, credit, verify your employment, verify your income. Or better yet, he says, hire a property manager. Hire somebody that does it for a living. His work paid off. After our interview and nine months after they first moved in, Mario and Anne were evicted. So you guys have not been in at all? No. Not at all. Tari and our crew went with Karen and Skip as they entered their house. They had lots of parties, it looks like. Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> these are broken, all these blinds. What's all this stuff? The backyard left a mess. How does the pool look? Terrible, it's green. Oh, no. I, I'm just happy that they're out of here. Karen and Skip are owed over $15,000 for rent. That's not including what it'll take to fix the place. And that's why they've decided instead of moving back, they're going to sell. I'm still working and when I should be retiring. It's what Tari did too. I'm not going to be violated again. She, Skip, Karen, and others have endured the same difficult path. What's your message you want to get across today? Make sure and go with your gut. And do your homework. As for their serial squatter's next victim. They're already on their way someplace else. If it fits their pattern, their new home could be just miles away. I just feel sorry for the next person. If you would like to learn more about the topics in this special, head on over to abc10.com to find our latest ABC10 Originals investigations and other major stories we're covering. Well, now let's move from issues and controversies seen in our housing market to creative solutions in our own backyard. Have you ever heard the term van life? It's a popular lifestyle that's gained steam in the recent years by what people would call digital nomads, who, as the name implies, live in a van. Here's to the point photojournalist Vanessa Bazuto, who caught up with a Northern California company giving people the chance to live the van life. During the pandemic, my wife and I decided to purchase a camper van and we were kind of doing weekend trips. Since we were working remotely, we decided Let's just move into the van. <laughs> so we sold all of our stuff and then traveled permanently while we work remotely. Today's the day that we go on our grand adventure. We sold our house, we sold a car. It's a little surreal that we're pulling off right now. I know. 
We did 43 states, 30 national parks. We're just driving and there's just this epic waterfall just right next to the river. No idea it was here and it's just insane. We got pregnant with Marshall while we were on the trip and it was just special to like have that time to be together. Behind us is the Columbia River. We're at the Vista House. Our goal was to live in the van for at least six months and about nine months in, it felt like it was time to go home. And kind of along the way, we had family and friends that asked us, you know, where can we rent one of these things? We want to have that type of experience. And that's when we decided to, you know, come back, come back to the Sacramento area and start this business. This was supposed to be a side hustle where we invited our great friend, Elon Gitman, to be a business partner. He was going to kind of run the business and I was going to still be an attorney. We started, you know, working out of Kevin's shed. But we quickly kind of saw how much potential this idea had, and so we just both invested everything we had into the idea. The idea just totally took off, and we had two vans, and they sold out almost instantly, and then we bought a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. We're a custom van upfitting company, and so we take your commercial cargo van and then we upfit it with a custom layout to fit your exact needs. The purpose of a van is kind of to live with less. There's a minimalistic aspect of van life. There's a big market for people wanting us to build vans, especially after they rent the vans. So uh, we kind of started learning how to do the building and stuff like that. COVID was a, a big catalyst for this to really take off. And now with social media, a lot of people do want to experience this. Everything we source is local from the lumber we use to the different hardware. We have a local cabinet maker. These cabinets that we purchased, they have the exact curvature of the sprinter walls. We have a local person that does all our cushions. We have a local person that does our woodworking. All we do is buy it. We support another local business and then we just install it. Very important to work with the different local businesses around here just to you know, give back to the community because they've given so much to us. We really want to be pillars in the community and you know, that starts with you know, keeping stuff local as much as we can. Because of our experience being on the road, we have kind of dual lenses in the business. We have a lot of insight on van life from the perspective of living in a van and then we also have a lot of perspective from renting the van. Everything's headache free. You know, we have solar charging, alternator charging. You can plug into shore if you want to. You know, everything's super simple and easy to do. One of the key features about our business is we don't charge for mileage. You know, having the experience we've had traveling in a van across the country, there's so much freedom with that. Paying for mileage is totally counterintuitive to the experience. And that's why we love doing the unlimited mileage because you can really just pick up and go. If you like a place, stay there a couple more days. Oftentimes we build these great relationships with our customers and you, you become part of their trip. I'd never done it. I'd seen big motorhomes, but I wanted something a little bit smaller. So I was excited and, and my experience is people, they're dying to have me open the door and show them the inside. Like there's a restroom, there's everything, there's a sink and they're surprised such a small vehicle and it drives like a minivan. You know, I built forts with my brother when I was little and this is kind of like having my little fort at my house. Since my first trip out with a van, I was thinking, I wish I did this in my 20s. And uh, the rates for a van overnight, it's really no different than a hotel. So when you think of a really long road trip, the inconvenient part is like the comfortability. You're kind of stuck, cramped in your car. You don't have a bathroom. You don't have any way to store your food when you're going across the country. So you can really have the flexibility of going with your kid's schedule um, and not having to like be back at the hotel for naps or be back somewhere to do something. You just have everything with you all the time. I think everyone should just try to explore this country because it has so much to offer and getting out of your comfort zone and experiencing something you've never experienced before just helps with personal growth. It literally changes your life. It gets you up and moving. And the pandemic, I think, saw a lot of increase in recreational vehicles and, and we're just keeping it going now. I think what we do here is special. This whole business did change my life in a, in a great way. There is the sheer vision to support van life. Here in Northern California, we have a whole bunch of beautiful scenery and places that you can go camp. And since it's so close to Rockland, you're able to take a van up to Tahoe for a weekend and have a great time. We're really connected to van life. It's just really special to us and we love sharing that with other people. And I think that really sets our business apart. 
Now let's talk about a solution that is not too unfamiliar to some, tiny homes. ABC 10's Becca Haberger takes us to a woman who is working to solve the homeless crisis by implementing a solution in her own backyard, literally. Welcome to Safe Harbor, a community of four tiny homes for families transitioning out of homelessness and into permanent housing. Everyone's dealing with something different, so the average stay is about 45 days. Robin Moore is the founder of We Force California Inc., the nonprofit that runs Safe Harbor. She came up with the idea during the COVID lockdown when in person volunteer opportunities ground to a halt. How do you put your heart on lockdown? She opened not only her heart, but also her own backyard, which is where Safe Harbor is located in Sacramento's Del Paso Heights area. This is our kitchen area, and we have utensils, and they can use the refrigerator, and they have a washer dryer. We Force board member Christine Jefferson says families don't always gravitate to the community kitchen when they first move in. Because they were so used to being homeless that they didn't really have anywhere to cook. So we had to encourage them to come in here and use this area right here. Safe Harbor took in its first family in December of 2021 and has served about 50 people altogether in its nearly 14 months of operation. Families are screened and referred by another local nonprofit, Family Promise of Sacramento. By the end of this month, we should have our 20th family that has come down that Safe Harbor path. When they walk down, they're anxious, I don't know where they're coming from, sometimes out of their cars, sometimes out of hotels and motels because they're working just to be sheltered. We're all used to the homelessness that you see, you know, at the intersection or the river area and you see all these. There is an even bigger layer that you don't see. And there are families that are just trying to make it from day to day. This is family number five. Yellow yeah, is your this color. Is Oh, it is beautiful. Love you. you look nice. Christina Talley and her 15-year-old daughter became homeless after leaving an abusive relationship. They were the fifth family to come through Safe Harbor, and Talley calls it life-changing. The biggest thing, I think, was the no-judgment zone. That allowed me to release the shame that I had in reference to being connected to someone who had been addicted to methamphetamines, to being in a domestic abusive relationship. Um, <laughs> that, that right there, I think that was the most powerful point for me with this whole entire program. And just that little White House alone did that. Just being there, your conversations with Rob and here and there, and just, how are you? I don't know how I am, but you know, and then the next thing I know, I could tell her how I am, and that's huge. <laughs> Tally and her daughter have moved on from Safe Harbor and are now living in an apartment. We're wanting to be on the track of home purchasing and we are just really excited to get this part started because it's a forever thing, right? Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I could have found me if it wasn't for you, God. Through it all, Moore remains a supportive person in their lives and beyond even what I could even imagine that could happen. And I'm like, I deserve this. And they're telling me that I do. And more wants to help more. WeForce has received a $100,000 grant, which more plans on using to grow Safe Harbor. Our plan is to go next door with two more units and an actual resource center to help even more people transition out of homelessness because no single person can solve the crisis, but everyone can do something. Let's get this done. <laughs> Together we're a force. We've looked at mobile and tiny solutions, but what about something tech savvy? Let's say 3D printed homes. ABC 10's Becca Habegger introduces us to two Northern California companies that are printing homes and changing the way we see home building. This is the sound of progress. This is our batch plant and mixer. And these are two people bringing that progress to Northern California. I'm the founder and chief visionary officer. Matthew Guile and Donna Jamian. And I am the CEO. Lead Emergent 3D, a company based in Redding, where Guile's family moved four years ago. We moved here two weeks before the car fire. 
On the list of California's top 20 largest wildfires, the Carr Fire burned nearly 230,000 acres across Shasta and Trinity counties in 2018, destroying hundreds of homes and killing eight people. As wildfires threaten lives and homes amid California's housing shortage, 3D printing is an evolving technology that could make a difference. Why? Because Emergent 3D says their process of printing on-site using concrete is faster and less expensive than conventional construction. Today, if the average home is taking eight months to build just because of supply chain issues, perhaps we can get this 3D printed one done in about six uh, months or so. Using this all-electric 3D construction printer from the Danish company Kobod, Emergent 3D plans on producing what they call the Wildfire Restoration House, a 1,200-square-foot, three-bedroom, two-bathroom home that meets all of California's requirements for building in wildfire-prone areas. To try to get our disaster recovery families rebuilt quickly and in more fire-resilient homes. They'll be printing houses in paradise this fall, where the 2018 campfire destroyed thousands of homes and killed 85 people. For families that are moving in that maybe have been traumatized as a result of having to flee for their lives and have their homes burned down, to have a concrete home can give you some peace of mind. Over in Oakland, a company called Mighty Buildings is focused on two crises, housing and the environment. Check out these finished exterior walls, all 3D printed right here at Mighty Buildings facility in Oakland. You can see the printed resin-based layers made up of 60% recycled material. Their goal is to be as sustainable as possible as they partner with developers to 3D print entire neighborhoods. Our homes are modern looking, they're bright, they're focused on energy consumption. Chief Operating Officer Russ Atassi says Mighty Buildings is working with developers in California now and has plans to build in other states and countries too, addressing a housing shortage that goes beyond our state lines. We're 75 percent faster end-to-end -end deploying homes versus traditional home construction. But 3D printing alone won't solve California's housing crisis, so we wanted to find out what's preventing developers and construction companies from building more traditional homes like these to meet the demand. Hi, I'm Christopher Brown. I'm the uh, president of Next New Homes Group. We're ingrained in every part of the Sacramento real estate market. Normal front door of the house is down in this way. We met up with Christopher Brown in Roseville, where his company is building 11 higher-end homes as part of a larger development. You know, we went through an exorbitant increase in demand during COVID. Unprecedented. We as home builders normally go, oh great, we're going to build more homes this year. Well, we didn't have materials and we didn't have any labor. The price of lumber alone, that's over 60% higher than the 25-year average. That goes into the price of the house. Plus, he says the permitting process can take years, and those fees drive up costs too. The North State Building Industry Association estimates an average of about $95,000 in fees per house in the Sacramento region, and 55,000 throughout other parts of the Central Valley. Every time we raise prices and we're building a home for $500,000, people have to understand what went into that is probably about $490,000 worth of cost. There's that little bit left over. If you understand that, you know, that helps to understand how do we fix things in California. Could 3D printing make a difference here? Even though everything we do is very risky because the market ups and downs, but we're a very risk averse business. Partly because we know how to build things and we know what works. We would love to bring more new things like 3D printing and those kind of things, but if we brought, brought that to a community here in Sacramento, we now have to educate all the building officials, all the planning officials, because it's different. Something these NorCal companies know all too well. We're working with jurisdictions, regulatory agencies. There's definitely an educational process because these are different than your stick build operation. You then give to the inspectors. Emergent 3D is excited to have approvals from four local governments for its wildfire restoration House. After the city of Reading, we got it approved in Shasta County, in Butte County, and in the town of Paradise. So remember these names. As 3D printing technology evolves and these companies continue to grow, Emergent 3D plans on printing their homes to help more than just wildfire survivors. We really want to help address workforce housing, affordable housing, disaster recovery, and homelessness recovery housing. And Mighty Buildings plans on printing entire sustainable neighborhoods with hundreds of homes each. I think we're just scratching the surface where this can go. Adding to the housing stock and chipping away at the housing crisis one layer at a time. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this adventure into our housing market and showcasing our work here at ABC 10. If you want to learn more about any of the stories we covered here or just want to stay informed, just visit us at abc10.com or tune into our newscast.